Moshe Rabbeinu's own uh, children were not at Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Says Vayikach Yisrael Chote Moshe Sipora Eishes Moshe Acha Shelachel Veshnei Boneho. That means Moshe Rabbeinu's own children were not present at at uh, at what Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Isn't that strange? Why would Moshe Rabbeinu's own kids not be there? Why did God plan it like that? He sent them away, and now Yisrael is bringing them back. So why? Avram, why is Moshe Rabbeinu's own wife and kids were not at Yitzhak Mitzrayim? He got it to Labincha. So the Belzer Rebbe explains, according to the Baal Shem Tov, he got it to Labincha. They say the shoemaker's children go barefoot. Yeah. Moshe Rabbeinu, his own kids were not there, why? Because he's going to have to perfect the technique the Yigadot Labincha. Our kids weren't there either. Why should I believe us? So Moshe Rabbeinu, start in your own backyard. Your own family is not going to be at the great miracles of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. You're going to have to perfect the technique where they will be able to what? Relate to it even though they weren't there. So therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu's own family was not Yitzhak Mitzrayim. God planned it that way that he's going to have to convince them that it happened anyway, and this way he's the Av, he is the what? Moshe Rabbeinu. So he's gonna have to start with his own family, he got his Labincha, even though our kids were not there, but we're gonna have to tell them the story to make it real. And Moshe is gonna show us the way. And therefore God planned that his own children were not at, uh, at what? At Kabbalah Torah. It's amazing how the, the Torah doesn't tell me any stories. It says that Moshe went to greet his father-in-law and he kissed him. Why do I need to know you who the 3,300 years ago that Moshe greeted his father-in-law and he kissed him? Because Why is that important? He's a loving guy. Huh? The Torah is not a history book. He's a loving guy. So the Beis Yosef learns halacha. What? What covered of? Beautiful, beautiful. You, you ladies are on the ball. The Beis Yosef brings the halacha that since ishtoy kigufo, since what? Your wife is like your own body, just like you're obligated to show respect for your parents, you're obligated to show respect for what? For your in-laws. So Moshe kissed his father-in-law Yisro to teach the halacha. The Beis Yosef writes this, that just like part of honoring your father is to kiss him. So the same thing is with a father-in-law. Isn't that incredible? We learn ishta kigufa, Yiddish Michael, that a person's wife is like his own body, just like you're obligated to what? Nechama, honor your own parents, you're obligated to honor your in-laws. Who taught us that? Moshe Rabbeinu by kissing his father-in-law. Don't show, don't show them under the bus. You know the difference between outlaws and in-laws, don't you? No, Ruvain. Huh? Avram, what's the difference between outlaws and in-laws? At least outlaws are wanted. Uh, uh, no, no, no. No. By Yishaklo. So Torah is not telling me any stories over here. So Moshe Rabbeinu tells him, by Yichad Yisro, al kol tova. Moshe tells him about the great miracles that took place at Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. His own family wasn't there, so he's telling Yisroi and his own family of the great miracles of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim and Kriyas Yamsuf. And it says, Vayichad Yisro kol tova. Yisroi rejoiced on all the good that Hashem did for Am Yisroel. Vayichad Yisroi says, Rashi vayismach Yitro. Yisroi rejoiced. And Rashi, so if it says, Yisroi rejoiced, why do you say vayismach? How come vayichad? Vayichad, and Rashi said means simcha. So write by Yismach. Why do you have to go like this when you can go like this? Write by Yismach Yisro. So Rashi said, by Yichad, he rejoiced. Dover Acher, by Yichad, also means that his skin became like stuck with needles. He made Tzar Ibud Mitzrayim, remember. He was a cabinet minister in Pharaoh's government, Rabbi Yaakov, you know that? Yeah. So he's, the, the word Yichad means stuck with needles. His skin felt like stuck with needles on the death of what? Of the Mitzrim who wore what? His former people. He was a minister in Pharaoh's government. So Rashi seems to be contradicting himself. One shot is Yisroi rejoiced on all the good that Hashem did. Another shot, his skin became stuck with needles. He was, he was uh, felt anguish for his former what? 
colleagues who were drowned. So is Rashi uh, contradicting himself, Avram? How could you rejoice and be in anguish at the same time? What? You can. Beautiful. What's your name? Shoshana. Shoshana. It's beautiful. The human mind and the human heart, Nechama, is so complex that Rashi is teaching that a person can experience joy and anguish at the same time. It seems like a contradiction, Rivka, but it's not. That's how complex we are. And Oh, what's an example of a mixed blessing? Ooh. I don't want to repeat that, should I? No, I shouldn't repeat that. Mm. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, Henny Youngman, you say, I took my mother-in-law on, uh, on a pleasure trip? No, I took my mother-in-law where she's never been before. I took her to the kitchen. Ooh. Uh, please. No. We see how complex the human mind is, Avram, that a person, Rashi, is so profound. Yisrael rejoiced and he felt anguish at the same time. Is it possible? Not only is it possible, but like Shoshana said, it's actually codified in halacha. It's codified in halacha in the Rambam Neshulchan Aruch. If a beloved parent dies and the child is really in mourning, in anguish, he lost a beloved parent, but the beloved parent left him a million dollars, the child has to make two brachas. Right. He makes Dayan a MS and he makes a Shechiyonu. Now, isn't that incredible? Is he a bipolar? No. Halacha acknowledges the complexity of the human mind and the human heart that a person can feel great anguish and great joy at the same time. On one level, a child lost a beloved parent and he's really mourning, a beloved parent. So he is mourning and he, Halacha says, you have to acknowledge that avelut by making dayan emet. On the other hand, you can't deny that the child now has a million dollars, which he didn't have yesterday. So on a certain level, he's also what? Rejoicing. So halacha codifies that. You make a shechiyanu. Now, isn't that incredible that dual emotions, how complex the human mind is, and therefore uh, it's possible that Yisrael on one level rejoiced for the fortune of Israel. On the other level, he felt anguish for his former for his former uh, colleagues. And it's not a stira. It's not a stira. Ivdut Hashem b'simcha. You're supposed to serve God with simcha. Apostle can tell him 100. Ivdut Hashem b'simcha. Till him 100. Till him 51, King David says, Lev nishbar benitke. What does God want? A broken and sad heart. So in Tillam 100, Nechama, he says, Ibn Hashem b'simcha, serve God with joy. In Tillam 51, he says, what does God want? Lev nishbar v'nitke. King David, make up your mind. Says the Kutzka Rebbe, Arona, there's nothing as complete as a broken heart. Hmm? Whatever that means. Huh? There's nothing as complete as a broken heart. That a person davens because what? Chana was morat nefesh. Chana, in the book of Samuel 1, she davened morat nefesh. Is she Ibn Hashem b'simcha? On one level, <clears throat> one level, she's bitter. She doesn't have a child. <clears throat> but another level, she acknowledges that she's not alone. Imo yanoichi betzara. So that made her happy. Even though I'm bitter, I'm suffering, but I know God feels my pain. Psalm 91, Imo Anochi Betzara, I am with him in his pain. Who is him? Eviyid. So, yes, she's bitter, upset, but another level, she is rejoicing that what? That God feels her pain and suffers along with her, and that is very comforting. And this is what we learn here from the Pasha Yisro. Now, when did Yisro come? 
Did he come before Matan Torah, after? Now it's obvious that he came. Moshe Rabbeinu tells him, Vayadati es chukei elohim ve'estarotav. Yisrael is wondering, why are all these people standing in line waiting? What are they waiting for? So Moshe tells them, Vayadati es chukei elohim ve'estarotav. I let them know the laws of God, the Estoratav. What does Estoratav mean? And his Torahs. So obviously Yisrael came after, because what's Moshe telling him? I teach them God's laws and his Torahs. Doesn't say Torah Soi, says Torotav. Because we didn't get one Torah, we got what? We got two. So obviously he came after. Otherwise, what is Moshe telling us, teaching them the Torah, two Torahs? Why did God give us two Torahs, not one? So the Medjur says that God went shopping the Torah. He went to all the nations, Avram, the UN and the EU, and they all turned them down. We're not interested. He came to the Jews and he said, you didn't have something very good for you. What's the first question a Jew asks? How much is it? God said it's free. So we said, in that case, we'll take two. Avram, that's why Torah taught. So obviously Yisrael came before what? Bef after. Yeah. So why is this coming written before? If he came, not to confuse me. Why is Yisrael's coming written before Matan Torah when obviously he came after? Otherwise, how could Moshe say, I teach them God's Torah? What's the message? To teach that Derech Eretz Kodbala Torah. Torah is very important. But what comes before Torah, Avram? Vayikra Rabba, Perik Tes. Derech Eretz Kodbala Torah. Who is a Derech Eretz man here? Yisro. The great Yisro, how much Derech Eretz he asked for Moshe, the Jewish people, even though he's a Zakain, he leaves his place and he comes out to the Midbar and he's Moshe Nefesh himself to become a Ger Tzedek. That message of Derech Eretz, that comes before the Torah and therefore his coming is written before the Torah. Another explanation. Why do you have a parsha of Matan Torah written after a convert. Matan Torah is in which parsha? Parsha is Yisroi. Why couldn't it be born Parsha Moshe, a born Jew? Why does the Torah have to be given and named after a Ger? Yisroi was a Ger, he was a Pope. Yisroi was a Pope, right? And then he became a righteous convert. So why Dafke name a parsha after him? Why is that? And why have it before Matan Torah? So the answer is, says Evan Ezra, we were a Jew by birth. We were born into it. Yisroi was a Jew by choice. Right, Michael? That's right. So the Evan Ezra says, don't be satisfied being only a Jew by birth. Aspire to be a Jew by choice. Who was the role model? Who was the first Jew by choice? Abraham. No, Abraham wasn't Jewish. Yitro. Yisro. No such thing as Judaism until Kabbalah Satyra. Don't mix me up. Abraham didn't practice Judaism. He practiced Noahidism plus. Okay. Seven plus Brit Mila. The first Jew by choice was Yisro. So Yisro is our role model that don't be satisfied to be, to accept the Torah because you're born into it aspire to accept the Torah, to choose it freely, and who showed us the example, Yehuda? It was what? Yisro. And therefore his coming is written before Kabbalah the Torah, and therefore the Parsha is what? Named after Dafka Ger Chedek. And the same idea, why Mashiach has to come from a Ger? King David comes from Ruth. She is a convert. Why not from a base Yaakov girl? Why could Mashiach come from a base Rivka girl, a base Yaakov girl? Why did Mashiach have to come, Rabbi Yaakov, from a convert? David comes, his grandmother was a convert to Judaism. Why can Mashiach not come from a born Jew? Because only when a Jew by birth has the excitement and the enthusiasm and joy for Torah that a Jew by choice has, only then can Mashiach come. It is Rabbi Yaakov. Therefore, Mashiach has to come from a ger. Because a Jew by birth has to be excited and enthusiastic. And what? 
thirsty for Torah as a Jew by choice has. And only then can the Mashiach come. And therefore, the Mashiach has to come, Dafke from what? Yehuda. A convert. Because we're born into it. The converts, I'm so excited. I envy, I have Baruch Hashem, I made a few gay rim. I envy their enthusiasm. Baruch Hashem. Our Bezdin made a few converts and they're so excited. We have to aspire, Nechama, to that excitement and joy that a convert has. And when that happens, then Mashiach will come. Yes? What? What? Right. Nachon. Doesn't help. Nachon. So God offers us the Torah. The yitem li segula mikol oamim. You will be segula. What does segula mean? Treasure. My treasure. But the Baloturim says the word segula is from the word segol. Segol in Hebrew means a triangle. Three dots. The three dots. The dikudot avra. Remember the triangle. Three dots. So the Baal Turim says, Yitam li segula, from the, the word segol in Hebrew, the nekudot, the three dots shaped like a triangle, Yehuda, right? Right? So the Baal Turim says, Api kabala, v'yitam li segula, the Zoyer says, Yisrael v'yoraita, v'akodesh baruch hu chad, Israel, the Torah and God, are all part of the same love triangle. Mm. So God says you're joining the love triangle. The Torah, God and the Jewish people are part of the same segula, the same love triangle. Pretty interesting. So the Jews said Nasa v'nishma, right? The Jews said what? Nasa v'nishma. So if that's the case, v'yisyatsu v'tach sahar. So why did God have to place us underneath the mountain? And the, the Talmud and Shabbos says, Kofa lehem har kegigis. God lifted up the mountain over us like a barrel. And he said, if you accept the Torah, mutav vimlav, shom te If not, it's all over. I think it's called in Virginia, a shotgun wedding. Yeah. Huh? If you don't say I do, Avram, you don't say I do, it's all over. West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia. I think it's called a shotgun wedding. Oh, no. Make my day. Now, God made us an offer, Ruvain, that we just could not refuse. Now, what's going on over here? Is this any way to begin a relationship? It's a Catholic wedding. Huh? A Catholic wedding. A shotgun wedding. First of all, we said Nasa Vinishma. So we said, we'll take it. So why did God have to force us? So the many reasons. One reason is the morale explains al pi Kabbalah, there's a posuk in Pashas Kitetse. If someone takes a woman to be with him against her will, and she looks like the wicked witch of the West, and he looks like Robert Redford in his prime, Remember him? If she wants, she can force him to marry her and never let her go. If she doesn't want, she sues the pants off of him, right? She has to pay Nezek, Tsar, Ripu, Sheves, Boishes. But let's say she looks like the hunchback of North the Dame and he looks like Burt Reynolds in his prime. So the halacha says, remember him? The halacha says, I'm dating myself, that if she wants, she can force him to what? Marry her, and no matter how ugly she gets, he can never, never, ever divorce her. If she wants. It's up to her. So the Morali Prague says, Kabbalistically, that's what God did over here. God knew we're going to get pretty ugly, Connie, throughout the centuries with many sins. And God will be tempted to divorce us. So he did an act of coercion. I'm stuck on you. No matter how ugly we get throughout the centuries with sin, God can never divorce us because he follows his own Torah. In Pashas Kitet say, That's one explanation of why God had to force us, even though we said what? 
Now, Sevenishma Yehuda, he's stuck with us, right? No matter how ugly we get with Averot, he can never divorce us because he follows his own Torah. But there are many other explanations. If you analyze the Gemara in Shabbat, page 88, Kofalem Har Kigigis, God lifted up the mountain like a barrel. Roll out the barrel. Now, isn't that strange? It should have said God lifted up the mountain like a mountain. Why did God turn the mountain into a barrel? Huh? And he said, if you accept the Torah mutav, vimlav, shom te Is that proper grammar, Yehuda? If you don't accept the Torah, should have said, po te Ask any old pan teacher. Shom, over there will be your burial. What over there? Here. I'm holding the mountain over your head. If you don't say I do, here will be your burial. It doesn't say that. It says Shom. Shom means over there, over there. Should have said Po. You hear this? So it's a complete misinterpretation of this passage. According to my Rebbe, Rapam Zatzal, we don't understand this Gemara. Why does the Gemara say God turned the mountain into a barrel? Why not God? He lifted up the mountain. A mountain. But he turned it over. Why? Kigigit. What is a barrel, Ruvain? A barrel is hollow inside. A barrel is hollow inside. Think. One minute. A, a barrel is hollow. A hollow barrel put on you can't hurt you. And the, was God threatening us to show on a wedding day? That's no way to begin a relationship. God held the mountain over our heads as a barrel. What is a barrel? It protects, it preserves what's inside. If you accept the Torah mutav, the Torah will protect you like a barrel. You'll be an eternal people. Vimlav shom te not po. What does shom mean? Where's there? Outside the barrel. If you don't accept the Torah, you'll be a regular people. Where are the Phoenicians? Where are the Assyrians? Where are the Babylonians? Where are the Greeks? Where are the Romans? All gone. If you accept the Torah, the Torah will preserve you. A barrel, Yehuda, represents... A pickle protects you. Wine <coughs> preserves you. You'll be preserved. You'll be eternal people. If you don't accept the Torah, then Shum. Where's Shum, Lillian? Outside the barrel. You don't have the protection of the Torah. Eventually, you'll be buried. I'm not going to bury you now, but eventually, you'll become extinct like all the ancient nations. So it's not a threat at all. The God was just expressing it. It's not a threat. Inside the hollow barrel, You'll be preserved. But outside, you'll become a regular people and you'll wind up where the Phoenicians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians. Interesting. What? What? Pretty interesting. So, uh, yes, go ahead. If that's the case. Go ahead. Why they talk about Purim being the time that we didn't have that statement, but we accepted forthright the, the Torah. Right. So why do they say that then? If this is the Peshat in this, in this Gemara, which I agree, it sounds very good, but you know, I heard it the other way, that maybe it means that there was a coercion, and if there was, then on Purim we didn't get coerced, we accepted it you know, wholeheartedly. So Your Kashi Reb Ruvain was asked by Rav Shlomo Omar, when he was the chief rabbi of Israel, I heard him on Shavuos night at the Yeshurin, and he asked your question, make my day. Now he's the chief rabbi of Jerusalem. But when I heard him, he was the chief rabbi of Israel, and the Shavuos night shear, he asked Ruben's question. The question is, why do we say that on Purim they accepted the Torah willingly? If I'm saying that this was no coercion at all, so what do I mean willingly as opposed to coercion? Kibu be kiblu. So he has another interpretation. All equally true. Now remember, Agatha Gemara is not to be taken literally. Remember the Ramban told us 
disputation in Barcelona that the Talmud consists of two sections, Agada and Halacha. Only the halachic part of the Talmud must be taken literally. The Agada part, that God held the mountain over our heads, that's Agada, said the Shlomo Amar, and that's not to be taken literally. What does it mean? It means as follows. When God revealed himself at Kabbalah Satorah, he took off the mask. The truth became so plain, so open, that we just couldn't, he didn't threaten us, but it was as if he held a mountain over our heads. When God takes off the mask, he's playing peekaboo with us. Why does he play peekaboo? Otherwise, no free will. Understand? If God wouldn't wear the mask, there'd be no free will. But Kabbalah Satoira, he took the mask off. Once God takes the mask off, you're like an Olam Abba, where you don't have any free will, how could you go against him when you see him so clearly? The truth was so clear. All the miracles God revealed himself in all of his glory, it's as if he held the mountain over our heads. It's not literal. Agada Gemara always speaks in allegory. It says the Ramban, the Marsha, the Maharal. Not literally held the mountain over our heads. That's no way to begin a relationship. Yiddish Yehuda. As if. As if our free will was gone. When the truth is so plain, God, I made you an offer you can't refuse. Once I reveal myself, how could you say no? Right? But at Purim, God's hand was hidden. His name is not even in the Megillah, Ruvain. Everything looked like a string of Kawinki Dinkies. Hmm? So there, we still had our free will. God was completely Hester upon him. Everything looked like what? Chance. And we still accepted the Torah. That's a higher level. Why is it a higher level? Because we can't see him clearly. Because he couldn't see him at all. His name is not even mentioned in the Megillah. So it looked like chance. And I thought Cain, we saw him. That's a higher level. That's why we're greater than Malachim. At Kabbalah Satoira, we were like Malachim, Rabbi Yaakov. No free will. The truth is so plain, we became robots. As if he would have threatened us. But by Purim, where he is not seen at all, his hand is totally gloved, you got to read between the lines. Afal Pikain, we saw him, but it was so easy to say what? Quinky dinky. That's a much higher level. That's Rav Mar, Shlomo Mar, answering Ruvain your, your very good, your very good question. Thank you. Okay? So when we exercise our free will, when God hides behind the mask, Hester Punim, Aster Punai, and it's so easy not to see him, Michael. And we do see him anyway. We're exercising our free will. That makes us what? Greater. That's why a human being is greater than what? Than an angel. And therefore, in a way, Purim was even greater. Because we didn't see any open miracles at all. And yet we chose to accept the Torah willingly and what? And... Uh, and knowingly. Rabbi, yes. Is it true that an angel does not free will when a human does? That's exactly what we're saying. An angel has no free will. Why? Just like a disembodied soul. Because in the world of truth, in Olam Haba, Yehuda, when the bodysuit comes off, the plain God is so open. You see him so clearly, how could you have free will to do otherwise? So a disembodied soul is a malach. The Ramam says when a tzaddik dies, he becomes a malach. He has no free will anymore. He's stuck in neutral. Only when you are what? Encased in your bodysuit and God hides behind the mask where free will can operate, that's when you become great. No pain, no gain. Who said that? Pepsi? No. No pain, no gain. Right? It's only the struggle that will make a person great. It's the struggle. And therefore the Talmud says in Tractate Avodah Zarah something very strange. When Mashiach comes 
and God removes the Yetzahara, the Talmud and Vadazara says, Avram, the Rishayim will cry and the Tzadikim will cry. When Mashiach comes and God removes the Yetzara, the Rishayim will cry, I understand, they'll cry. Miller time. Mashiach will settle up with them. But why will the Tzadikim also cry? Rav Yaakov, why should the Tzadikim cry? When Mashiach comes, it'll be great. Why will the Tzadikim also cry? Says the Marsha. This same idea, Rivka. What makes a person a Tzadik? We shall overcome. Eze Gibor, HaKovish is Yitzro. The struggle with the Yitzhahara. No pain, no gain. What makes a person a Tzadik? Rabbi Yaakov, what? The struggle. <laughs> You're working out, you know. If you don't, yeah. If you don't work out, you get flabby. How do you get spiritual muscles? <laughs> Why is he working out there? If that's true in the physical world, that if you don't work out, you become what? Flabby, it is certainly true what? The spiritual world. You become a couch potato. So the tzaddikim will cry, Chava. Because without the Yetzirah, I'm going to become flabby, like the guy in the gym. It's the struggle that makes a person great. But when the game is over, no pain, no gain. And therefore, Purim, in a way, was much greater than what? Than, than what? The first Kabbalah Satorah. When you exercise your free will to see God, you are a gibor. Kovish is Yitzhak. But when God removes the mask, Avram, there's no pain, there's no struggle. So therefore, you're stuck in neutral. Mm. So therefore, we have to chop right now, right? We have to do it now. Nahon. Now, the Ten Commandments. Anoichi Hashem alakecha. I am Hashem, your God. So the Talmud in Shabbos 109 asks, how do you say I in Hebrew? Ani. So God knows Hebrew, right? Ani. So why does God say Anochi and not Ani? Huh? So Talmud Shabbos page 109 says, Anochi is an acronym. FBI, CIA, IRS. Anochi is an acronym. Aleph stands for Ana, Hebrew. Uh, Yehuda, Hebrew and Aramaic are sister languages. Onochi is an acronym. Aleph stands for Ano. Ano means what? I. Ano in Aramaic means I. Nafshi, Nun. My soul. Kaf, Tavit. I wrote my soul. Yehavit. What does Yehavit mean in Aramaic? Yehav means to give. You have it, get it, you have I it? Gave, I, gave my soul. I wrote my soul into the Torah and I gave it to you. Anochi, Aleph, Avram, Ano, God, I, I, Aramaic. No nafshi, kaf ktavit, I wrote my soul into the Torah, you have it. What does you have it mean? You have it. Don't you get it? You have it. Uh, wow. Yeah. So God, Kaviyochul, wrote his soul into the Torah and he gave it to us. So you want to know what's on God's mind? The Torah. Hmm? I wrote my soul, Kaviyochel, into the Torah, and I gave it to you. I'm a Shem God who took you out of Egypt from the house of slaves. So the famous question that all the Rishonim ask, what came first? The Exodus or Briyat Olam? Why didn't God say, I am Hashem, your God, who created heaven and earth? That preceded the Exodus. So why does God introduce himself as the Redeemer from Egypt and not the Creator? Because what? Very good. What's Rivka saying? God is not going to make a claim that he can't back up. Who saw the creation? Were we there? We weren't there. But millions of Jews saw the Exodus. So God says, I'm Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. I'm not making a claim that I can't back up. You all saw the Exodus, but none of you saw the creation. And therefore, God says the Redeemer instead of the Creator. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Rabbeinu Bechai. 
The Rambam says something incredible. Should I tell you Rebbeinu B'chai first, or should I tell you uh, the Rambam? I'll tell you Rebbeinu B'chai. He has another explanation of why God introduces himself as the Redeemer instead of the Creator. Rebbeinu B'chai says something amazing. There's a posuk in Sefer Devarim, v'halachta bidrachav, to walk in God's ways. Mahu afata. It is Michael. Says Rebbeinu B'chai. The reason why God introduced himself as the Redeemer and not the Creator is that what? Yehuda. We should, be we, should be we should be Redeemers. If a Jew is in captivity, whether it's uh, my, uh, Pollard or any Jew, therefore God introduced himself as the Redeemer and not the Creator because this is a command. Just like I redeemed you when you were what? A captive, a captive, you have to redeem Jonathan Pollard, Rabbeinu Bechai. And this Rabbeinu Bechai answers a very difficult Rambam. The Rambam says, Ein mitzvah gedola v'raba kepidyon shvuyin. There is no greater mitzvah in the Torah than redeeming captives. You this? The Rambam said that. Mikimi, that's what he says in, in, in Hilchus Matna Saniyim. One minute. But the last time I checked the Rambam Sefer HaMitzvot, Ruvain, that greatest mitzvah was not there. The Rambam says, Ein lecho mitzvah gedola v'raba kepidyon shvuyin. There is no greater mitzvah than redeeming a captive. So how come Chava in the Sefer HaMitzvot, it's missing? Is it the same reason as others like living in Eretz Yisrael or whatever? Because it's part and parcel of the... Close, but no cigar. Okay. <laughs> Says Rabbeinu Bechai, it's not missing. The Rambam in the Tayag Mitzvah's list, Anoichi Hashem Alekecho, to believe that I am Hashem, your God. What's the end of the Pasuk? Oh. I'm your Redeemer. Says Rabbeinu Bechai. It's not, it's in there. Remember that commercial? It's in there. In the Mitzvah of Anoichi Hashem Alekecho, in the mitzvah that the Rambam lists to believe that I'm Hashem your God, it's a two-part mitzvah. If you believe I'm Hashem your God, then you have to act God-like. I redeemed you when you were a captive. You have to redeem or try to help redeem any Jew that's a captive. So according to the Rambam and Beinu Bechai, in the first of the Ten Commandments is the mitzvah of what? Pidyon Shvuyim. So it is listed. It's listed under Anoichi Hashem Alakech on the Sefer Mitzvot. There's a mitzvah to believe in what? In the Creator. Rabbeinu Bechai said it's a two part mitzvah. If you believe I'm the Creator, then act like I acted. I redeemed you when you were a captive, and you have to try to redeem a fellow Jew when he is what? Held in captivity. So that's why it's a mitzvah gedola, varaba. It's actually contained, Yehuda, in the first of the Ten Commandments, and therefore God introduced himself as the Redeemer and not as the Creator. Isn't that pretty amazing? Wow. Pretty amazing. <coughs> now, the Ten Commandments is a formula for marital bliss. Do you know that? You heard this what I said, Yehuda? The Ten Commandments are for me of marital bliss. How do I know that? Because in the Ten Commandments, it says God will do chesed <coughs> for 2,000 generations, right? He will punish to the third and fourth generation, but do chesed for 2,000 generations. So Rashi explains what does it mean 2,000 generations? The world is not 2,000 generations old. What does it mean? You can't say 2,000 generations because the world is only supposed to exist 6,000 years. So you figure it out, Ruben, 6,000 years, good in math. What's a generation? 70 years, no? What's a generation, no? All right, how much is 25 times 2,000? But the world is only supposed to exist 6,000 years. How, Ruben, right? Let's say I think a generation is 70 years. You say it's 25 years. 
Okay, so 25 years? 50,000 years, actually. Right? Yeah. But we know the world is only existing 6,000 years. So Rashi, the Efshek Kipshuto, says Rashi, the world will never reach even a thousand generations. Because the world is only supposed to exist for what? For 6,000 years. So how could it be La Lafim? So therefore Rashi says it's an example that the Midot Tova Yetera Al Mide Praniot Achat Al Chamesh Meot. Because God's punishment is only up to what? Fourth generation. God's loving kindness is 2,000. Yehuda. How much is what? Four into uh, 2,000. So Rashi said it's a dogma that God's midah tova is 500 times greater than his midah for punishment. What does that mean? What does that mean? Hmm? That means God is teaching us that if someone does toy for you, you should constantly applaud him much more than you criticize someone for doing something wrong. Human nature is the opposite. Someone did you something wrong to you, you'll criticize him again and again and again, and you won't hear the end of it. Someone does you a taiva, I thank you already. What do you want again? <laughs> Isn't that human nature? But no, God is saying no. The midah tova should be 500 times greater than what? Than sticking it to someone. Someone does you something wrong, you should rebuke him. But enough once. But if someone does you a toiva, you should applaud him and thank him 500 times greater than you criticize him for doing something wrong to you. This is very important in the family life, to have a happy family life, right? Rabbi, Husband and wife. You got me in trouble here. Huh? Isn't that amazing? I thank her 500 times today. Isn't that amazing, Rabbi? This That's is my Rebbe, Rapam Zatzal. This is my Rebbe. It's incredible. Yeah, it's true, it's dishes, incredible, you right? Thank you 500 times. Huh? <laughs> right? <laughs> Your wife made you a delicious supper, right? I thanked you already. No. You have to thank her again and again and again. She does something that's not right, so you criticize it, but don't harp on it. That's the message over here. Wow, that's the message that I could bedrachav. That rewards must be expressed much more than what? Than rebuke. Isn't that an amazing lesson? Amazing lesson. The formula for marital bliss. Right? Express your toy 500 times ratio more than criticize someone that does something not correct. Does that come well, from children and their parents also? I think so. Okay. My writer was saying it about husband and wife. Hmm? Saying about husband and wife. It's amazing. In the Ten Commandments, wherever the Torah introduces Shabbos, throughout the Torah dozens of times, it doesn't just say Shabbos. It always says, Sheishes Yomim Tavod, Yomim Shabbat. So the Pirke de Bernosen, Rabbi Nosen, Pirke of Rabbi Nosen, and the Sifri asked, how come the Torah never introduces Shabbos without first what? Sheishes Yomim Tavod, Yomim Shvi Shabbat. Just once in the Torah, Dozens of times in Mitzvah Shabbos, it never just says, Rabbi Yaakov, you can check it out. It never says, of Yom HaShvi Shabbat Hashem Alehecho, without writing first what? She says, Yom Im Tavot. And only then, the Yom HaShvi Shabbat Hashem Alehecho. Says the Mechilta, why? You fasten your seatbelts? Mm -hmm. Are they fastened? Yes. Just like there's a Mitzvah to rest on Shabbat, there's a Mitzvah to work during the week. Mechilta and Pirke, I think they were Haredi. Mechilta and Pirke, always the Rab Nosen. That just like there's a mitzvah to rest on Shabbat, there's a mitzvah, Sheish as Yomim Tavot. Therefore, Shabbat is always introduced to Yehuda with what? Sheish as Yomim Tavot. Pirke, always the Rab Nosen. 
It's part of the same mitzvah, and therefore it never says Shabbos alone. And Pirkei de Renosin goes further, Ein Odomet El Tala. A person only dies when he's what? Tolchav Tala. What does Tolchav Tala mean? When he's bored, he's not occupied. He's not occupied, then you, 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 you go. A person has to study Torah, but he also has to have an occupation. He has to be busy. Not with stupid things, with creative work. What do the non-Jews say? Idle hands are the devil's workshop or something along those lines? I think lines? they say that. Yeah, it's yeah, so yeah, true. Yeah. It's so true. Ain other met el v'tol haftala. Obviously, Rav Nosen. Pretty amazing. So we learned something fantastic here, Yehuda, that just like there's a mitzvah, ain't gonna work on Saturday, ain't gonna work on Saturday, there's a mitzvah to work during the six days, and therefore the Torah always what? Puts them together. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing, right? Would you say that? Which one? Eel, what? Job, what? Oh, Job. Oh. <laughs> Person, the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, they all worked. That's right. Hillel was a wood chopper, Yochan Asanda was a shoemaker. The greatest rabbis in the Talmud all had what? They all had a pro pro profession. Huh? They all had a profession. But some people say, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is what? Made up. Okay, pretty interesting. <laughs> anyway, Mizbach Adama Tassali, the end of the Parsha, God says, Mizbach Adama. All I need is a mezbeach made out of what? Earth. Earth. Does God need a golden sanctuary with golden vessels? No. Plan A, plan B. Pretty amazing. A Barbanel and Sforno, they say, plan A was mizbach adama tasali. The entire earth was supposed to be God's sanctuary. But the Jews showed that they couldn't handle it. They hankered after something what? Golden. Gold, golden. They made a golden getchka. So God said, you made a golden getchka, take gold and do it my way. Da 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 da. Isn't that incredible? Plan A was Mizbach Adama. That's enough. The Jews showed they couldn't focus on that. They wanted something that glitters, all that glitters is not gold. They made a golden getchka. They wanted a, a physical representation. I don't want to say, what? Right? So God said, okay, I'll give in to you. Take gold and make golden kruvim. Take gold and make a golden ark. But that's plan B. The Medri says, Yovay Zov Shebe Mishkan. Rabbi Yaakov, Yovay Zov Shebe Mishkan. Let the gold come of the Mishkan, the Yechaper, Al Zov Shebe Egel, and atone for the gold of what? Of the Egel. But if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But we broke it, we sinned with gold. So God says, take gold and what? And make what? A golden getchka. You see this idea throughout Judaism. The Tikkun comes from the Chet. We're not that far from Purim. I don't want to scare you. Why is there a mitzvah to feast on Purim? To get shikr and feast? Because the sin was with a tray for feast. We attended a tray for feast where the food was tray for and the entertainment certainly was tray for. So now make a kosher feast. So therefore on no Purim is a mitzvah to feast to let yourself go. You sinned with wine. And the feast, now take wine and what? Do it my way. Da 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 da. The tikkun comes from the chet. You see that throughout Judaism. Therefore, God commanded a carbon pesach, a sheep, not a turkey. Even though a turkey has less cholesterol, says Rambam. He knew about cholesterol. He says, because the Jews worship the sheep, the zodiac of the lamb. Right. What's it, that Pisces? What's it called? Pisces? Lamb, which one is that? What? That was their God. Aries. No, Aries. 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 Aries.
the Jews, you look in the book of Ezekiel, the Jews also worshipped the lamb. So the Ramam explains, therefore God said, take a lamb and what? Do it my way. Otherwise, a turkey has less cholesterol. So in Judaism, the tikkun always comes from what? From the chet. And therefore, there's a golden mishkan. God's plan was mizbach hadama. Well, we couldn't handle it, so... Uh, what? 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 Why do I still have the taste for lamb shawarma? Ah, that's why Jews love shawarma, Chava. Bring back the good old... We remember the good old days, right? The real shawarma, that was what? Carbon Pesach. That was Carbon Pesach, right? Pretty interesting. Any questions or comments? Great. Thank you very much.